Um, and actually, <laughs> actually, there's an interesting connection, I think, between Kierkegaard's writing and his anxiety. Um, he, I mean, in a way, writing and his relationship to his authorship became probably the most significant relationship of his life. It was the way he related to himself. It was the way he tried to understand himself um, and to understand himself in the relationship to God that he you know, experienced himself as living. So, so writing is really the kind of fabric of all this. Um, and you know, Kierkegaard himself, as I'm going to go on to explain, was a very anxious person and had quite an intense experience of anxiety. And it's really through writing that he, in a way, was sort of working through that. So obviously in the concept, concept of anxiety, that's um, a very, in a way, a very scholarly kind of text. And he's working through psychological questions, theological questions, obviously philosophical questions. He's not writing about his own experience there, um, but I think more generally, writing was, yeah, the way in which Kierkegaard both expressed and sought to understand his own anxiety. Um, so yeah, he was, most, most of his works were written in the 1840s and into the early 1850s and uh, until he died at the age of 42 in 1855. And the concept of anxiety, um, there's the, the, the Danish uh, cover there on the right of the screen. The book was published in 1844. It appeared under a pseudonym, Vigilius Haufniensis, which means the watchman of Copenhagen. Now, some um, Kirchhoff scholars will spend a long time thinking about Kirchhoff's use of pseudonyms. Um, many of his works that he published, he wrote under pseudonym. He, he used lots of different pseudonyms. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time thinking about that. Um, you can ask me questions about it if you want to later, but um, just to note that the work is written using a pseudonym, and that's always with Kierkegaard raises questions about, you know, to what extent is Kierkegaard himself um, kind of owning the, the views that he puts forward in the text. So it always adds an extra layer of complexity um, to reading Kierkegaard, which as I say, I'm not going to spend too much time going into today. Um, Oh, sorry, the PowerPoint, there we go. So before we go into the concept of anxiety, I'm just going to talk through a couple of really fundamental principles of Kierkegaard's thought that I think are going to help contextualize his thinking on, of anxiety. Two things I'm going to talk about. First, subjectivity. And then I'm going to talk about ambivalence. So subjectivity and ambivalence. These are, I think, two hallmarks of Kierkegaard's philosophy, um, two really distinguishing features of his philosophical style, his way of thinking, um, in a way what's so innovative about his, his thoughts. Um, and so subjectivity and ambivalence, I think, are two things that just really run all the way through his philosophy. So whichever text you read, I think these concepts will be helpful. So to begin with subjectivity, this is a concept that's really associated with Kierkegaard. Um, he's famous for saying subjectivity is truth. You might have heard that associated with him. Um, it would be a mistake to interpret that as a kind of relativism to say, oh, you know, what is true for me is true for me and what's true for you is true for you. He's, that's not what he means when he says subjectivity is truth. Rather, he's thinking about the fact that there's a certain kind of truth that he sees as most essential to the religious life, to the Christian life. You know, Kirch was a Christian Lutheran thinker. So his his, his, his religious thought is, is very much, you know, within that tradition. Um, so subjectivity is, you know, the kind of truth um, that belongs to a life. So, for example, what does it mean to live truthfully, to be true to yourself, to be true to God, um, to live authentically, this idea of fidelity in the sense of being true to something, um, is a is a is a concept that encompasses both faith and truth. So fidelity is is part of what Kierkegaard means by subjectivity. But also, I mean, he's just a philosopher who 
is really interested in the human experience, in what it is like to be a human being, what it's like to live a life in this world. And so that's the perspective from which all his philosophy really begins. Um, and it's the terrain that his philosophy explores. Um, and so gathered under this heading of subjectivity, uh, you know, a few key concepts here, desire. Desire is really the heart of Kierkegaard's philosophy. We could describe it as a philosophy of desire. I mean, he sees human beings as essentially desiring creatures. I mean, he's like Augustine in this respect, um, but desire is absolutely, you know, the central, central sort of thread running through his thought. And for Kierkegaard, human desire is pretty complicated. Um, and we'll see how that plays into his account of anxiety. Freedom, our awareness of possibility. So when Kierkegaard is thinking about freedom, and again, it's a concept that we can associate with Kierkegaard um, and with existentialism more generally, he's not thinking about a kind of abstract philosophical debate about free will. He's rather thinking about the experience of freedom. And one of the ways in which he writes about this is through um, the sense that we, are, we have an awareness of possibility. Um, part of what it is to be human is to be able to imagine how things might be different, to have choices, to see different paths ahead, also to look back and think, think about how things might have been otherwise. So it's that sense of possibility that he thinks kind of haunts human existence. Um, and it's both a blessing and a curse. I mean, this is, goes into this idea of ambivalence, which I'm going to talk about soon. Um, but yeah, our freedom is something that we, we all experience, we inhabit it. Um, and it's, it's, there's a kind of ambivalence that Kierkegaard will express towards it. And then experience. Um, what do human freedom and desire feel like? Um, so again, it's that subjective perspective, um, that turn inwards to, um, to the experience of, 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 of the individual. And so Kierkegaard was, I suppose, I mean, he was writing at a time when um, science, modern science had become the model for philosophical and theological inquiry. You know, the idea that theology could just be a kind of rational science or that um, using a kind of empirical historical methods, um, scholars could read the Bible and find out, you know, where it came from and sort of, yeah, so there all these kinds of um, scientific methods that were really being entrenched in the modern university when Kierkegaard was a student. Um, and so he's really resistant to that and pushing against that and instead placing, yeah, a kind of individual subjective experience at the centre of his philosophy. And then finally, and this is, again, you know, really important, um, subjectivity involves a certain conception of selfhood. Um, and for Kierkegaard, the human self is relational. To be a human being or to be a self is to have a relationship to ourselves, a relationship to God, and a relationship to the world, a relationship to other people. And those three kind of aspects of, of relationship are fundamental to the experience of selfhood. To be a self is to, is to sort of exist in these three different kinds of relationship, obviously at the same time. <laughs> um, and these relationships to ourselves are uh, their relationships both of awareness, but also of desire. So, so, for example, to say that we have an awareness, a relationship to ourselves, is partly to say just that we're kind of conscious of ourselves, we're, we're, we're aware of ourselves, um, but it's also um, to have a certain kind of desire. So the idea of wanting to be yourself or not wanting to be yourself, wanting to relate to God, but also not wanting that, turning away from that. Um, so desire and sort of awareness or consciousness are always part of this, this self-relation. Um, and Kierkegaard thinks that this relational sense of self is what it is to be a spiritual being. So Kierkegaard sees human beings as spiritual beings. Um, and when he analyzes what that means, 
two concepts that really come into the foreground are first anxiety and then despair anxiety and despair so he wrote this book concept of anxiety he then a few years later um, wrote a book called the sickness unto death where he talks about despair um, and in both cases there's a kind of parallel between these two concepts of anxiety and despair um, in both cases he thinks that it's because we're spiritual beings that we have this anxiety it's because we're spiritual beings that we have despair so these are part of our condition as as spiritual beings as selves in relation to ourselves to god and, and to the world so the, i've just put this passage here from the sickness unto death on the slide um partly because he's actually talking about anxiety here um but it gives us a good sense of the kind of anxiety that Kierkegaard is interested in. Just as a physician might say that there very likely is not one single living human being who is completely healthy, so anyone who really knows mankind might say that there is not one single living human being who does not despair a little, who does not secretly harbour an unrest, which is anxiety, an inner strife, a disharmony, an anxiety about an unknown something or a something he does not even dare to try to know, an anxiety about some possibility in existence or an anxiety about himself, so that just as the physician speaks of going around with an illness in the body, he walks around with a sickness, carries around a sickness of the spirit that signals its presence at rare intervals in and through an anxiety he cannot explain. So anxiety there is a sickness of the spirit. It's something to do with the fact that we're spiritual beings. And also what's really important here is the fact that Kierkegaard says that anxiety, the kind of anxiety he's interested in cannot be explained. And this is, this is an important point that he will make in the concept of anxiety too, that there's just this kind of lack of explanation when it comes to anxiety. So it's not about tracing the source of the anxiety back to some specific fear, some specific worry or threat, um, some finite thing. Um, for Kierkegaard, anxiety is a universal human experience. That's what that's what he's saying here. Every Everybody has it, even if it only signals its presence at rare intervals. In a way, we're sort of carrying it around with us all the time. And it's something that we can't explain. And obviously, if we can't explain it, it would make it very difficult to remedy it. Um, if you can't sort of trace the cause of a disease, how can you start to think about treating it, making it better? So ambivalence. I talked about desire earlier. Ambivalence is basically what happens when desire is drawn in two directions at once. When you want something, but you also don't want it, or you want two um, conflicting, contradictory things. Um, and ambivalence is absolutely just a fundamental kind of mood of Kierkegaard's thought. It's really striking. Um, it struck me really only, re I mean, I've, I've you know, written a lot about Kierkegaard over the years, but it was only when I wrote the biography that I came to realise, I first realised that it was part of Kierkegaard's psychology, that he was just very ambivalent about everything he loved. So, you know, his father, Christianity, Regina, the woman that he was engaged to and then broke off, um, even his writing, you know, all, all of these most intense um, relationships of his life, the things that he most cared about, he had a really deep ambivalence towards. So that was really interesting on the psychological level. But then I realized that it was also just a kind of theological trope as well, running through his interpretation of Christianity. And I'm going to give you some anxiety, some um, examples of that in a moment. Um, but Kierkegaard was aware of this problem of ambivalence, and he wrote a really nice uh, text called Purity of Heart is to Will One Thing. And as the title suggests, the ideal there is willing one thing, um, having purity of heart. Actually, that ideal comes to be seen as kind of impossible when you read this text so the whole thing is about not being able to will one thing and he talks about double-mindedness so double-mindedness or ambivalence 
um, having your desire pulled in different directions is really sort of fundamental. Um, and I just want to explain how ambivalence and anxiety are connected with each other. Um, and actually they're, they're connected in, in, in different ways. So the first way in which anxiety and ambivalence are connected is just to say that anxiety is a kind of ambivalence. The experience of, of anxiety is an experience of divided desire. So in the concept of anxiety, Kierkegaard says this sort of quite cryptic sounding thing. Um, anxiety is a sympathetic antipathy and an antipathetic sympathy. So what does that mean? <laughs> um, well, it's typically sort of paradoxical in a way, which is quite, um, quite, yeah, quite typical for Kierkegaard. Um, he has this entry in, in one of his journals written around the same time that I think helps to clarify what he means by this sympathetic antipathy, antipathetic sympathy. Um, so he's talking about desire. He makes it clear here. Anxiety is a desire for what one fears. So that's a sympathetic antipathy, a desire for what one fears. Um, and so conversely, perhaps an antipathetic sympathy is um, the fear of what one desires. So a desire for what one fears, perhaps also a kind of dread of one's own desire. Um, anxiety is an alien power which grips the individual and yet he cannot tear himself free from it and does not want to for he fears, but what he fears, he desires. And then he says, anxiety makes the individual powerless. So because the will is torn in two, uh, that renders the individual powerless because in a way you, you sort of don't know how to move if, if you're being pulled in two different directions at once. So this sense of a kind of paralysis and powerlessness um, that he sees as the consequence of anxiety. So we saw that anxiety is ambivalence. There's also an ambivalence about anxiety, i.e., is anxiety a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah. How should we feel about anxiety? And Kierkegaard says, well, it's both. It's both a blessing and a curse. Um, and again, this is part of the sort of structure of Kierkegaard's thinking that we see cropping up in, again and again. Um, so here he says, um, in the concept of anxiety, if man were a beast or an angel, he would not be able to be in anxiety. Since he is both beast and angel, he can be in anxiety. And the greater the anxiety, the greater the man. So that's a sort of puzzling statement. He seems to be saying that in a way, you know, the more anxiety, the better. He's partly saying that the greater the anxiety, the greater the man. And I think his thinking here is, is we can get a bit of a clearer sense of what he's saying by looking at this text, The Sickness Unto Death, where he wrote about despair. Because what he says here about despair, kind of you can transfer it over to what he thinks about anxiety. So this is a section of The Sickness Unto Death where he makes a distinction between the possibility of despair, so the fact that we can be in despair with a kind of creature who can be in despair that's the possibility of it and then also the actuality of it which is what it's like to actually be in despair so basically he says here that the possibility of despair the fact that we can despair is something sort of good about us it's, it's because of our kind of spiritual nature that we can despair on the other hand actually despairing is a horrible thing <laughs> Yeah, so it's both a blessing and a curse again. But I'll just read you this passage because it might help you to understand this ambivalence about anxiety. Is despair an, an advantage or a drawback? Regarded in a purely dialectical way, it is both. If one were to stick to the abstract notion of despair, this is like the possibility of despair, without thinking of any concrete despairer, one might say that it is an immense advantage. The possibility of this sickness, despair, is man's advantage over the beast, over the animal, he means. And this advantage distinguishes him far more essentially than the erect posture, for it implies the infinite erectness or loftiness of being spirit. So it's because we're spiritual that we're capable of being in despair. So the possibility of the sickness is man's advantage over the beast. Um, to be sharply observant of this sickness, so to really pay attention to it, 
constitutes the Christian's advantage over the natural man, the, the, you know, the non-Christian or the non-religious person. To be healed of this sickness is the Christian's bliss. So then it is an infinite advantage to be able to despair. And yet it is not only the greatest misfortune and misery to be in despair, no, it is perdition. So we see here Kierkegaard identifying, you know, two extremes at once. At one end of the spectrum, we've got kind of the Christian's bliss, the blessedness, the specialness of being human. At the other end, we've got misery and perdition, you know, being lost, being like a lost soul. And all of that is sort of part of what it is to, to, to be in despair. And kind of the same is true of anxiety, I think. The actual experience of anxiety is horrible, as we all know. I'm sure we've all experienced it. And yet the fact that we can have this anxiety for Kierkegaard is a consequence of our freedom. It's a consequence of our spiritual nature. Um, and so in a way, it's better to be able to, to be anxious than not to be able to be anxious, because if we were just some other kind of creature, we would lack yeah, the kind of consciousness and freedom that, that is, the, is the sort of ground of our anxiety. Um, some other um, points, sort of continuing this theme of Kierkegaard's ambivalence about anxiety. This is from Fear and Trembling, probably Kierkegaard's most famous book. It's about the biblical story of Abraham and Isaac. Here he says, only the one who is in anxiety finds rest. Only the one who draws the knife gets Isaac. And he's basically saying here that the only way out of anxiety is through anxiety. You, you can't avoid it. You can't sort of find any escape from it. But if you go through anxiety, then on the far side of anxiety is rest. And rest is kind of like the opposite of anxiety. Yeah. So only the one who is in anxiety finds rest. You have to go through it in order to, in a sense, get some kind of respite from it. And then we have this, this idea that anxiety is saving through faith. And this is the last section of the concept of anxiety, which you may have had a look at. Um, and this is what Kierkegaard says here. This is an adventure that every human being must go through to learn to be anxious so that he may not perish by never having been in anxiety or by succumbing to anxiety. Whoever has learned to be anxious in the right way has learned the ultimate. Anxiety is freedom's possibility and only such anxiety is through faith absolutely educative because it, because it consumes all finite ends and discovers all their deceptiveness. Whoever is educated by anxiety is educated by possibility and only who, he who is educated by possibility is educated according to his infinitude. Now, you know, typical Kierkegaard, it's not exactly straightforward to figure out what he's saying there. Um, but the point I want to make is that, you know, anxiety has some obvious drawbacks because it's just a very unpleasant experience. Um, but Kierkegaard is also trying to say that it's a great, it has something great to teach us about being human. Um, and in fact, that our the sort of path to salvation goes through anxiety. It's actually through our anxiety that we can be saved, partly because of our anxiety that we may um, be, so, be so desperate that um, we, we turn to God or we, we, you know, we, we seek God. But also this idea that anxiety is just inseparable from our freedom and our freedom is something that's just really fundamental to our, um, our spiritual nature. And then just to sort of put this in a bit of a broader context, um, and this is a bit more of a sort of biographical perspective, um, Kirchhoff's ambivalence about Christianity itself. So um, again, this is something that I just really came to understand through writing the biography of Kirchhoff, how, how um, his relationship to Christianity, his relationship to God was characterized by a deep ambivalence. And he traces this back to his upbringing. He had quite a, quite a strict um, pietist upbringing by, uh, by his father. And in a journal entry um, that Kirchhoff wrote, um, you know, at, quite, quite late on, on in his life, but looking back on his childhood, 
Um, he describes his father here. He says, he made my childhood an unparalleled torture <laughs> and made me in my heart of hearts offended by Christianity, even if out of respect for it, I resolved never to say a word about it to any person and out of love to my father to portray Christianity as truly as possible. And yet my father was the most loving father. <laughs> So again, a really complicated and very ambivalent sentiment there that he expresses about his, his father. Um, he made my childhood an unparalleled torture, and yet he was the most loving father. And we see here that how Kierkegaard's very ambivalent relationship to his father is inseparable from his relationship to the, the Christianity that his father taught him. Um, to put it, slightly you know, more straightforwardly in this, in this entry, he says, I acquired such anxiety about Christianity and yet I felt myself strongly drawn towards it. So again, ambivalence expressed there. It makes him really anxious and yet he's drawn towards it. So anxiety and ambivalence there just sort of really kind of knit together as part of Kierkegaard's experience of Christianity. Um, Claire? Yeah. I'm so sorry, this is, just so wonderful, thank you. Um, do you mind if I just ask a quick question on that? Sure. Um, when he um, when he's referring to uh, his anxiety about Christianity in the context of his childhood, are there particular doctrines or teachings that he has in mind? Um, hmm. Well, that's a good question. Um, I think it was a kind of, well, there was certainly a very sort of strict ideal of, um, I, I mentioned that Kierkegaard had a, had a pietist upbringing. Um, so there was this quite sort of strict ideal of being a holy person um, and of imitating Christ. Um, also a very, quite a sort of emotive, um, emotive style of Christianity with a sort of emphasis on Christ's suffering. Um, so yeah, the, the, Though I don't know if it, I don't think it was so much the actual doctrines, but more the kind of atmosphere. Um, that yeah, the sort of Christian atmosphere that he was brought up in, if that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. We can maybe talk a bit a bit more about that. Um, yeah. Um, and these are now. Um, passages where Kirchhoff is talking specifically about Jesus and again expressing this ambivalence towards um, Jesus himself and again this idea of being both a, both a blessing and a curse he actually says this very explicitly about Jesus though he possessed the blessing he was like a curse for everyone who came near him like an affliction for those few who loved him so that he had to wrench them out into the most terrible decisions so that for his mother, he had to be the sword that pierced her heart for the disciples, a crucified love. And then again, this one is actually sort of, he's writing to uh, Jesus in this journal entry. You became a sword through the heart of your mother, a scandal to your disciples. Oh, why did you not lower the price? Like he's basically saying, why did you not make it easier <laughs> to follow you? Why is it so hard to be a Christian? When I have doubts about myself, and it seems to me as if I must first and foremost cut the price for my own sake, like make it easier is what he means by cut the price. And when it seems to me as if I owe it to others to cut the price, you know, in his writing to make Christianity easier. Now it can cause me anxiety to think of you as if you would become angry, you who never cut the price, yet non nonetheless were love. So he's talking there about his anxiety in relation to Christ. This idea um, that Jesus is both infinitely demanding and that he sets such a kind of high ideal um, for his followers and um, the sort of expectation that, you know, the person who follows Christ might have to give up everything. They may have to suffer, be persecuted. You know, this really kind of high price, this sense of a great sacrifice that's demanded of the Christian and yet infinitely 
lenient, infinitely forgiving, merciful, and so on. So again, we see this sense of like two extremes coexisting at once. Um, that's part of what's so sort of paradoxical about Kierkegaard's thought, that he brings these two extremes together, holds them in tension. Um, but it's also the ambivalence, yeah, the, the kind of the, the emotional um, experience that he has of all this is obviously this one of anxiety, but also being drawn towards it, being drawn in two directions. Okay, so I'm ho hopefully that sort of helps just to think about, you know, some of the sort of deeper structures of anxiety for Kierkegaard. I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, what he argues in the concept of anxiety about the relationship between anxiety and sin. So very briefly, and this is in my um, guide for the perplexed section, if you had a chance to look at that, or you can look at it later um, if you want to go over it. So for Augustine, the doctrine of original sin, you know, very, very crudely is as follows. Ad Adam's original sin is the cause of human sinfulness. It's transmitted biologically, um, through sex to Adam's descendants. So that's why we're all sinners, because we have inherited Adam's sin. So Adam's sin is the cause of the sin that we have. That's the sort of Augustinian view. Obviously, it's much more nuanced than that, but that's just as a sort of point of comparison. For Kierkegaard, he has a really different approach to this question. So rather than being the cause of our sin, he sees Adam's sin as the paradigm of human sinfulness. So basically, when we read the story of the fall of Adam, that's um, a kind of paradigm for what all sinfulness, what all sinning is like. So the story of Adam um, isn't an explanation for our sin, it's rather a mirror in which we see our own situation, we see ourselves reflected in that story. And this is actually typical of Kirchhoff's way of reading the Bible more generally. Um, he often reads biblical stories as mirrors that he wants to hold up to the reader, um, mirrors in which we can see ourselves, we can see our own situation more clearly. And that's really an invitation for the reader to kind of connect with the story existentially, emotionally, ethically, rather than to kind of read it in a more detached sort of way. Anyway, so Adam's sin is the paradigm and the mirror of human sinfulness. Adam's sin, argues Kirchhoff, is repeated in freedom every time we sin. So every time we sin, sin is kind of coming into the world afresh in a new way. So he's trying to say that you know, our sinning isn't really that different from Adam's sin. You know, the first sin, sin kind of comes into the world. Every time we sin, that sort of coming into being is, is just repeated afresh. And then he also argues that sin arises from an encounter with possibility. So there's this experience of freedom, a sense of possibility that gives rise to desire, then anxiety, and then sin. So that's the kind of chain um, that Kierkegaard is exploring when he thinks about the story of Adam and, and what it shows us about, um, about sin and anxiety. Um, and then just as a sort of corollary to this, um, for Augustine, the fundamental sin is pride, a kind of self-assertion, trying to kind of assert ourselves independently from God. Uh, and because sin is pride, then the most significant sort of virtue of faith is humility, which is obviously the kind of antidote to pride. For Kierkegaard, sin is a combination of pride and fear. So for Kierkegaard, pride and fear are actually like two sides of the same coin. Um, he has a really interesting discourse where he, he writes about this. I'm not going to go into details, but just to say, <laughs> um, whereas for Augustine, the fundamental sin is pride, for Kierkegaard, it's this combination of pride and fear, and that means that faith involves not just humility, but also courage, you know, courage being the antidote to fear. So fear, obviously fear is connected to anxiety, um, and so it's really kind of intrinsic to Kierkegaard's understanding of sin, that fear or anxiety is, is sort of part of what it is, of part of part of what sin actually is. Okay, so with that in mind, just um, turning to the Genesis chapter, um, 
which, um, I mean, like many of Kierkegaard's texts, the concept of anxiety is based on a biblical passage. I mean, fear and trembling is like that. Fear and trembling is about the story of Abraham and Isaac. The concepts of anxiety, for all its kind of abstract theorizing, is fundamentally about this biblical passage. And it's actually quite helpful, I think, often with Kierkegaard to sort of anchor his text in the biblical passage that he's talking about. It helps to kind of ground us um, because his writing is often so complex and convoluted. Bringing it back to the story um, that he's commenting on, I think, is quite a helpful way into his uh, writing, into his texts. Um, so I've just put a couple of extracts from, from the story here um, and really just sort of comparing the two passages. So, um, you know, the beginning of Genesis, whenever God speaks, he just kind of says the words and whatever he says comes into being. So God says, let there be light and there is light. He names the light day and the darkness night. So here we have this sort of perfect correspondence between God's speech and actuality. Yeah, God says something and it just is exactly as he says. And then we um, start to sort of deviate from this in Genesis 2, when um, God, you know, takes Adam and puts him in the Garden of Eden, Garden of Eden, Eden. And God gives Adam this command. He says, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So what's significant here is that now when God speaks, we find this word not being used. So he says, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden. So he's freedom is suddenly introduced and also this not and so this idea that suddenly here language is not in perfect correspondence with reality because we've got this this negative here um whereas everything else god has said has just been purely affirmative purely sort of coinciding with reality with this not it's almost as if language kind of peels away from reality um, and what we have there is a kind of space for possibility, something not being a certain way, which kind of opens up the possibility that something can be like this or it cannot be like that. It opens up this possibility. Um, and then um, the serpent comes in and sort of exploits this not. So as soon as the not is said, as soon as this little gap opens up between language and reality, the serpent kind of slides into that gap and opens it up. So it says, uh, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? So here, we have a question and language is kind of peeling further away from reality. When we have a question, you're opening up a bigger space for possibility. You know, did God really say it or could it have been different? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. So, you know, Eve repeats the prohibition that she's heard. And then the serpent contradicts her. So we have this kind of double knot. He says, you, you will not certainly die. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. So you're probably very familiar with this passage. It's you know, the narrative of the fall. But what Kierkegaard draws from this is this analysis of possibility and desire, anxiety and freedom. So we have, you know, both first with God's prohibition, then with the serpent's question, this sense of language kind of making space for possibility. Um, and that possibility is kind of exciting. It's the possibility of freedom, some choice, um, some kind of question about what the world might be like what is really the case you know, did God say it or didn't he will you die or won't you um, and so that is an experience for Kierkegaard of anxiety and it's interesting that you know the way that is 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 experienced by by Eve here 
is this awakening of desire. Um, you know, she looks at the fruit, um, it's pleasing to the eye, it's desirable for gaining wisdom. So she has this desire that kind of reaches out. Um, and then, of course, the sin happens um, through possibility, desire reaching out, and so on. So this is really the kind of um, foundation for Kierkegaard's thinking about anxiety. So, um, yeah, just to sort of go 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 back from that, um, we can see here the way that sin arises from this encounter with possibility, as I said before, freedom, possibility, desire, anxiety about desire, ambivalence about desire, and then sin happens. And I think Kierkegaard's point is that sin is a kind of decision that is in a way a kind of attempt to stop the anxiety. Um, so there's the sort of uncertainty of anxiety, what shall I do? Um, this possibility is there. And then there's the attempt to kind of quash the possibility by doing something, you know, shall I eat from the tree or not? Shall I eat the apple or not? Well, okay, I'll, I'll eat the apple. And then that possibility is kind of settled and we're, we're back in something sort of concrete. Um, but of course that action is the sin. And it doesn't quash the possibility, it just opens up a whole new set of possibilities. And that's the way Kierkegaard kind of theorizes anxiety leading to sin. Um, and then this is a quotation that just kind of exemplifies what I've been saying about his argument, which is different from Augustine's. Through the first sin, through Adam's sin, sin came into the world precisely in the same way. It is true of every subsequent man's first sin, that through it, sin came into the world. So we are like Adam, our own freedom is sort of mirrored in this story Kierke was suggesting. And then finally, I just want to again, sort of step out from the concept of anxiety and think a little bit more about social anxiety, because again, from a biographical perspective, this was such a fundamental part of Kierke's experience. Um, kind of social anxiety, um, I talked about the fact that the self in relation is not just in relation to itself and in relation to God, but it's also in relation to the world, it's in relation to other people. Um, and Kierkegaard experienced this kind of social anxiety really intensely. Um, it was bound up with a sort of status anxiety, um, you know, anxiety about his reputation, other people's opinions of him, whether he was successful or not, whether his books were, you know, doing well, all this kind of thing. So this was just really, you know, very intense part of Kierkegaard's experience. And there's a kind of irony, because at the end of the concept of anxiety, he, he writes, one certainly should not be in anxiety about, about men, about human beings, and about finitudes, yeah, about sort of specific concrete things. He has this quite lofty account of anxiety as being sort of very spiritual. Um, however, you know, Kierkegaard himself was constantly in anxiety about men and about finitudes. Um, and, you know, this quotation from his journals where he says, all existence makes me anxious from the smallest fly to the mysteries of, of the incarnation. The whole thing is inexplic inexplicable to me. I myself most of all. To me, all existence is infected. I myself most of all. So we can read that as a kind of confession of anxiety, um, of Kierkegaard's personal experience of anxiety. But in a way, it still kind of misses off this sort of social aspect of anxiety which, you know, when you read his journals, as I obviously read, read them and, and, and his letters, Kierkegaard was constantly fretting about what other people thought about him, um, fretting about things that, you know, to an outsider might seem <coughs> really petty, um, you know, just like one comment that someone wrote in a review of one of his books, and he would just obsess about this for weeks in his journals, yeah, so all sorts of anxieties about, you know, yeah, kind of small things, but things that were very important to him. And I think this is something to bear in mind about being human, that um, the things that we get anxious about, on the one hand, they're often kind of petty, but to be human is to care about small things. Um, and there's a sort of spiritual aspect of that that we can perhaps talk about, um, that, you know, in relation to God, um, Kierkegaard suggests that God is the kind of God who cares about the small things, 
Um, so even though you might think from a kind of lofty spiritual perspective, you shouldn't be worrying about, you know, these very specific finite things. He also has this theological view that, uh, that God is a bit like a kind of mother who would really care about the, the sort of particular concerns of her child. So there's an interesting question there about, you know, petty anxieties and what their place is in the religious life. But just to get back to something a bit more empirical, um, <clears throat> I've got this quotation from uh, a guy called Hans Bruckner, who was a friend of Kierkegaard, good friend of Kierkegaard. And he said, with Kierkegaard, it frequently happened that when he reflected on some minor matter, he could make it into a little piece of world history. His sense of reality did not always keep pace with his expertise and reflection. And this is just, I can totally vouch for this. This is exactly what Kierkegaard was like. He was just constantly making mountains out of molehills and, you know, getting extremely anxious about, yeah, quite sort of small things. Um, and what's interesting in Kierkegaard there is this experience of sort of being visible, you know, being on show, being... Um, he lived in a small town, Copenhagen, in the 19th century. It was like a market town. Um, everyone knew who he was. He'd go out onto the street. Um, you know, he was just very sort of visible and kind of conspicuous and very much aware of the fact that he was in public view. Um, thought, he thought a lot about his image, how he looked to other people, the kinds of judgments that they were made of him. Um, there's a very clear parallel, you know, between sort of the contemporary experience of social media where we're sort of living our lives on display and often sort of thinking about the judgments that other people will make about us, how we look, how we appear, and so on. Um, well, this is a quotation from um, a book called Prefaces that I think is quite revealing about Kierkegaard. He, he writes there, to be an author in Denmark is almost as troublesome as having to live in public view, just about as problematic as concealing oneself on a plate and this idea of trying to sort of hide yourself on a plate obviously it would be impossible to do that but that sense of just being exposed to public view and yeah this sort of experience of anxiety that that um, gave him that sort of wanting to hide and obviously not being able to so finally um just to raise a few questions so the concept of anxiety attempts to draw <coughs> a clear line between psychology, so the psychological experience of anxiety that Kierkegaard is looking at in the book, and what he calls dogmatics or theological doctrine. He tries to sort of keep those things quite separate in the concept of anxiety. Uh, that's part of the structure and the argument of the book. On the other hand, you know, one of the most distinctive and compelling features of his philosophy is the way that he brings his own life, his own experience, into his writing. So psychology and theological doctrine, in a way, are very kind of interwoven in Kierkegaard's work, despite his effort to hold them apart here. So one question we might think of is, you know, what do the textual and the biographical aspects of Kierkegaard's anxiety, which I've just touched on um, in the presentation, what do those tell us about the relationship between theology and psychology, between doctrine and experience should these two things be kept apart can they be kept apart you know what do we think about Kierkegaard sort of bringing his own experience so much into his theology and letting it shape his whole way of thinking about Christianity um his ambivalence for example you know he turns that into a whole kind of theological doctrine to some extent this idea of two opposite extremes being held together in tension that for him is really the meaning of Christianity but it really expresses his own ambivalence towards it so do our own experiences of anxiety have a place in our you know theological and philosophical inquiries on this subject in a way the example of Kierkegaard kind of takes us in two directions with this on the one hand he argues they should be held apart on the other hand, he weaves them together in ways that become quite complicated for the reader um, when we think about it, when we when we approach his texts and also approach them with some awareness of, of his own biography. So I'll stop there, um, talk for quite a long time, um, but obviously happy to answer questions and hear your thoughts about all of this. Claire, thank you. That is such a gift. Um, my goodness.
All right, so it's on your mind. Um, I was specifically thinking while I was reading um, the excerpts from the concept of anxiety about the way like the regard says in that a person is in anxiety, not that a person is anxious. And I just thought that was really interesting and that being very like persistent with that terminology. I was wondering if you think there's anything to that, if you meant that in a particular way, or I mean, my reading of it is he was saying anxiety is something outside of the person that a person steps into through rather than an attribute of the person, but I don't know if that's correct. And I just mm. It is interesting, isn't it? Because it's, as you say, I think if you say, oh, the person is anxious, it can sound a bit like you're talking about their character traits or a particular experience. <laughs> Whereas Kiko is, is talking about it much more as a sort of fundamental situation that we're in. Yeah, I mean, I suppose you might say we're in sin as well, that the fall is the fall into sin. And so that terminology of being in anxiety seems to express that same sense of something that perhaps has, we've sort of fallen into. Um, and it also perhaps implies that we're kind of helpless to get out of it because we're like in it <laughs> um, and we can't, yeah, we, we, we can't bring ourselves out of it. Um, perhaps he, he, he is sort of hoping that through faith we might be lifted out of anxiety by God. Um, he seems to think that that would be the only way that we could get out of it. But yeah, I agree that that terminology sort of be, being in it um is interesting it's quite revealing about the way he's approaching the subject thank you mm. yeah it's a good question good observation um do you or, or Kierkegaard um see any benefit to anxiety besides it being tied to our um spiritual nature sorry can you just repeat that mm -hmm. Um, is there any benefit to anxiety itself besides it being related to us being spiritual beings? Huh. Um, well, I mean, I, I suppose, I mean, it's, I, I suppose I'd say it's more that that um, anxiety is like a fact. <laughs> um, you know, it's almost like a given um, as something that's, for Kierkegaard at least, that anxiety is, it's as much of a fact as our freedom is and as human sinfulness is. It's kind of on that level of just like, this is the way things are. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, you, the benefits of it it's I mean yeah so he says that well in a way it's better to have the capacity to be anxious than not to be because as you say you know we're spiritual beings we're free beings um the only alternative to anxiety would be to sort of be a kind of animal who didn't feel um so I mean I suppose you could say that more generally there's a kind of benefit to having a full range of experience so for example the capacity to feel you know a range of experience from, from sort of sadness to joy, you might say that that is, um, that's a kind of positive thing, um, you might want to say. Um, it's better to, to have that than to sort of be completely numb, for example. So I suppose you could see anxiety as part of that range of affective emotional experience. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a puzzling question, isn't it? I mean, in a way it's like, this is just how it is. Um, we can kind of see why it's part of something that's good. It's not that the anxiety itself is good, I don't think. It's more that it's a sort of symptom of something that we have reason to be grateful for. Um, but it's also just kind of an inevitable thing that we have to live with. Um, I mean, I certainly don't think that Kiko would say that it's good to kind of make yourself more anxious. Um, that, you know, anxiety isn't an experience you should sort of seek out because it will kind of make you a better person. I don't I don't get that sense from his philosophy. Um, I mean, he certainly, I think, would link the intensity of his anxiety 
to his hyper reflective character so you know he was just brilliant at like overthinking things um everything you know every every decision goes back to his sense of sort of every like petty little thing he would really kind of amplify turn it into something huge he would just sort of really really think and overthink things um and I suppose you could have a similar kind of ambivalence towards that you can say well being reflective you know it produced this sort of amazing philosophy he's like very very clever but it also caused him a lot of suffering and actually may, may have led him to some bad decisions in his life as well um I mean he was very conscious of the kind of disease of reflection it's something that sort of um not in a way it's not healthy to to be so to be so reflective and yet it's very productive and it you know he's a very creative person so yeah I guess you can see these things from kind of as quite complex in terms of the value that they have on that point Claire could you say that Anxiety is an energy that enables the discernment of the one dimensionality of, of um, social existence that um, enables uh, recognition of mediocrity of the system um, and of the capabilities of resistance. And, and perhaps that's going too far, but could you? Mm. That out in, in that way? Yeah, I mean, I suppose if we go back to what he says about sin, there is there does seem to be this idea that anxiety is a kind of motivate, it's a sort of catalyst for action, isn't it? So um when you have anxiety, as you say, it sort of it has a kind of energy and it makes you act. It may not make you act well, um, but it can generate activity. Um it's like if you're super anxious, you might sort of go and like tidy your house or something or you know it sort of generates lots of lots of energy or you might sort of get lots of work done in an attempt to flee from the anxiety so that's one way in which anxiety could be kind of productive I suppose um it also can provide well I suppose yeah the, the providing the motivation for faith you know to providing the sort of perhaps in desperation because the experience of anxiety is so acute and intense um, it might, I guess, awaken the need for God and for Kierkegaard, having a sort of consciousness of needing God was, um, that's really what it is to live authentically. Um, that's what the religious life is, to, to, be, to be conscious of that, that need, um, that religious need. So I guess if anxiety is, is yeah, awakening that that consciousness, then then it is a good thing, isn't it? It's something that is sort of, but it, but he's also saying that it leads us to sin, so it's, it is difficult difficult to say. Thank you. Thank you. Mm.